So in our last conversation, we made our way from Rousseau uh, through to Hegel, and then we ended up right on the edge of Marx. And as we kind of search through the consequences of ideas and where we find ourselves today and what has led to that development in philosophy. Um, but Stephen, if you were to pick up where we left off last time in regards to now we're on the edge of Marx, uh, where would you take us from here? Mm. Well, uh, all of these philosophers are important because they uh, have something important to say on all of the major issues in, in philosophy. What I'd say to, to complement the metaphysical and some of the political points that we were stressing last time would be the place of uh, morality and the place of power or how you conceptualize power. And obviously there are links between the two of those. But one very interesting thing about German philosophy especially, and I'm going to add a little bit of Danish philosophy in the persona of uh, Kierkegaard, uh, uh, is there's an inversion with respect to the place of morality and politics. And what you find, of course, in uh, the English tradition, in the British Enlightenment more broadly, in the French Enlightenment, in the American Enlightenment, and so forth, is a concern about bounding political power and political authority to morality. Right, so that there is a pre-political morality that is true, that is objective, that is universal. And whatever political structures we derive have to be responsive and stay within the strictures of morality. And one interesting common theme about all of the major 19th century German philosophers and adding Kierkegaard. And so here I will cite Hegel, we'll mention Marx. Uh, actually, chronologically, we would go uh, Kierkegaard doing his writing in the 1840s, then Marx, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and then Nietzsche is a, a, a hollowing out and a setting aside of morality for political purposes. Mm. Now, uh, most famously, mm. uh, you know, if we come, if we go backwards, we think of Friedrich Nietzsche and the title of his famous book, Beyond Good and Evil. Mm. And now that's not to say that he didn't think there was a place for values and the creation of morality and so forth, but the idea there is that what we take to be morality is something to put brackets around and, and to set aside or to explain in psychological terms, and that the people who are going to be the great new moralists or the great new value creators, they're going to go beyond that morality. There's a, there's a higher agenda to, to morality, or, or than morality, uh, some sort of proper creation of a station appropriate to human beings and, 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 and so forth. Mm. Uh, it's interesting, uh, I mentioned Kierkegaard a couple of times, uh, so I'll flesh this out a little bit. So uh, Nietzsche is an atheist, and so you might say, okay, fine, he's just you know, de, uh, you know, dismissive of religiously based moralities, but Kierkegaard is a, a Christian. He's a very strong theist. And what's fascinating about him is uh, uh, if you work through his, uh, his either or, uh, which is an important work, and in that work he has, a, in, in the subsequent work, Fear and Trembling, a panegyric to Abraham and the Night of Faith, all of this, you know, important to contemporary theology. But the earlier either or, as he presents it, is uh, that we have a, a fundamental choice as human beings about what our uh, orientation toward life is going to be. And on the one hand, one of the either's, or the either, or one of the, uh, the disjuncts is a kind of uh, aesthetic approach to life, right? Where, you know, it might be eat, drink, and be merry, right? And so forth. So it's a, a hedonism, and it doesn't have to be a low-grade hedonism. It can be quite a sophisticated hedonism, but it's going to be an amoral commitment to the life of pleasure and aestheticism, right, and and so forth. And to that, uh, 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 Kierkegaard juxtaposes the other disjunct or the other alternative, which is the ethical life, and that the ethical life is one of strict duty 
and there are principles and you follow them consistently. And of course, a lot of that involves a lot of self-denial and self-sacrifice. And so it is the antithesis then of any sort of hedonic or aesthetic right, approach to approach to life. Mm. But the interesting thing then is that, and this is uh, Kierkegaard as a post Hegelian thinker, so there's a kind of dialectical thing that's going on here. But he says that we actually have to transcend both of those. And notice what we're saying is we have to transcend the ethical. There's something beyond the ethical, something higher than the ethical. And this is a theistic form right, of Nietzsche's later atheistic form of saying going beyond good and evil. Is there something higher than that? So we're going to subordinate morality to something higher. And for him, he labels it the the uh, the calling of faith or the religious life. And so that then is it's very interesting because then he is saying to make the proper religious commitment, it is not an ethical commitment. It is something that goes beyond the ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that, that seems to imply that if you're going to be a properly religious person in the Kierkegaardian framework, you're not going to be an ethical person. And this is where the famous panegyric on Abraham becomes important because there you see Kierkegaard puzzling in anguish over you know, Abraham hearing this message that he's supposed to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. And he's uh, wrestling, uh, actually Kierkegaard's putting himself into Abraham's mindset saying, how can I possibly ethically justify this? Right? You know, on the one hand, it seems like God's a promise breaker because of the covenant that he'd earlier made with Abraham, that through Abraham the sons of Israel, right, and so on. You know, Isaac is a young guy. He hasn't done anything to deserve and any standard of justice, the death penalty and so forth. So you can trot through all of the possible ethical justifications, and there isn't one. Instead, it's a leap of faith on the Kierkegaardian account, and that means you have to leave behind the ethical life. So what's interesting to me then is you've already got two very powerful 19th century thinkers who are saying morality is of a lower order. It's a, it's a lesser concern. And this is a big inversion from the earlier modernist traditions coming out of the British and the French that want to subordinate uh, all individuals and certainly all political and social structures to, to morality. Morality is going to be foundational for them. And then, of course, we find uh, similar things in uh, both Hegel and Marx, the other two giants uh, of the century. Uh, you know, Hegel is uh, quite explicitly arguing that uh, providence or, or the divine or the absolute that is, uh, you know, working out its plan. Uh, it works through individuals and it selects certain great individuals to fulfill its historically divine purpose. And they are going to go out and they're going to smash everything in many cases, including, and you know, Hegel puts it almost poetically, the innocent flowers. Mm. Right? And thousands and millions of innocent mm. flowers will be crushed underfoot as divine providence works its way out. And then he goes on to, you know, to say, well, you know, we can't hold mere moral considerations up and say that in any way these are an objection to, you know, the, the absolute force and with its political divine mission working its way out and so forth. So once again, morality is going to be smashed and trampled underfoot in the, the face of something, something higher. Mm. And then there's a version of that, of course, in, uh, in Marx. Marx first, relativizes morality, right? Uh, you know, uh, morality is merely an expression of your group's class interests. Uh, so there's nothing absolute about them and those are evolving across time. Uh, and so nobody has any particular uh, uh, you know, trans class authority or objectivity to their group's interests. So when you have different groups with different moralities, it really just does come down to a power struggle. Might is going to make right. And he does think that ultimately the forces of history are on the side of the proletariat, and so their might is going to be prevailing, and they can use all sorts of revolutionarily violent things and act in completely brutalistic and uncivil fashions. And again, we can't, in the face of the march of history, you know, raise merely moral objections. So that's, I think, one very important thread. Uh, I think that's, a, that's an important inversion Right, they, so the, the place of morality being subordinated. And uh, so what that then is going to mean is by the time we get into the 20th century, we are going to have all of the schools and sub-schools and movements and activist movements that are inspired either by Hegelianism 
or various forms of Kierkegaardian theology or Marxism or Nietzscheanism, right? morality is not very high on their list of criteria. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can expect a certain sort of brutality to characterize 20th century movements. So uh, all of this is still in the 19th century, but and I know at some point we want to get to postmodernism toward the end of the 20th century, but uh, these are going to be foundational figures for them mm. as they uh, come of age in the 20th century. What was Nietzsche responding to or reacting to with his uh, thus spoke Zarathustra? You know, what, what was the response with that? Who was he, who was his, what was his reaction towards? <laughs> That's uh, uh, a hard question. I, I think what we have to say is Nietzsche is a brilliant philosopher. And so he's got something to say about all of the important philosophical issues, metaphysical, epistemological, understanding of what human beings are and or human nature, morality, social, aesthetic, political philosophy, and so on. So he would be reacting to the whole gamut as it has been developed up to the middle part of the, of the 20th century. So the uh, short form is what I would say is he is reacting to the Kantian epistemological framework. So mm -hmm. that the radically uh, uh, significant Copernican revolution, as Kant called it, that we have to abandon objectivity that our, ni our minds are not responsive to reality, that what we call reality is constituted by subjective structures deep in the, in the human mind, and there's no way for us to get outside of our heads to see if there's any mapping uh, between the contents of our awareness uh, or what's going yeah. on in our minds and the way reality is. So a deep move toward subjectivism, that the mind is imposing structures on reality rather than responding to structures given from reality. So he is deeply going to be a subjectivist. Uh, and he's also responding to uh, the, the Hegelian maneuver, where for Kant, all of the categories and structuring things, he takes them to be more or static, more universal to the species, and more, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more fixed across time. They are absolute. With Hegel, we get a, a kind of evolutionary framework, right? The, and his particular version of it is dialectic. But then what we have is that these uh, conditioning structures are themselves in conflict with each other and evolving across time. So you won't be able to say that what's subjectively true in any one era is also subjectively true in the next era and, and so forth. And then it's also going to be important uh, that uh, Nietzsche gets away from the Hegelian kind of uh, evolution because Nietzsche is born in 1844. And that me and he was very precocious, reading everything, brilliant teenager, um, primarily in classics, getting a first rate classics education in Latin and Greek. And he loves the Greeks and the pre Socratics and all of that. But he's keeping up off with what else is going on. And uh, of course, 1859 is the important year here because that's the year Charles Darwin publishes on the origin of species. Now, evolutionary ideas in the biological right. sense had been around right. obviously for, for decades. Uh, but then we've also got these evolutionary ideas in the metaphysical sense coming out of the Hegelian speculative tradition. So Nietzsche is aware of both of those. And so you do find in him a very robust and deep reflection on what evolutionary thinking is going to mean for philosophy all the way all the way through. And part of that is going to be a blasting into non-existence uh, from Nietzsche's perspective as a critique of moralism, the idea that there are objective moral truths and or universal moral truths that apply to everyone and or absolute moral truths that uh, are constant across time. All of that has to be washed away or blown away uh, to use a better Nietzschean type of metaphor. So then the question is going to be for Nietzsche, uh, where are we if we are deeply subjectivist now, coming out of that Kantian tradition, and we're combining that deep subjectivism with a deep evolutionism of some sort coming out of the Hegelian metaphysical tradition and the Darwinian biological tradition. So Nietzsche is still a teenager in 1859, 
but uh, but he's brilliant and uh, you know he gets his professorship in his early 20s and they offer it to him before even technically he's finished his PhD work you know such as the, the standing and the brilliance of this guy and he uh, starts to publish his major works in 1870 mm. uh, birth of tragedy is his first major so he uh, in the 17 the uh, 70s rather uh, 1870s and, and, and 80s becomes becomes important so that's a, again a bit of potted history, but to try to say in short form what Nietzsche is reacting to, that would be that would be it. Um, something that both James and I have noticed has really come out of your lectures on postmodernism, and in particular on Nietzsche, would be the use of the word uh, resentiment. Uh, resentment, see, si. yes. And how that plays forward today in terms of being yes. the root of a lot of. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing. Uh, yeah, aside from these uh, historical and uh, metaphysical, epistemological, biological currents, uh, and in Nietzsche's thinking, you do see him evolving sometimes in a more metaphysical direction, sometimes in a more kind of reductive, naturalistic or reductive, materialistic direction as well as as his time goes on. But uh, it, it, uh, I think there's a lot of truth to this to say that Nietzsche is one of the founders of psychology as a as a science, and it's interesting that he is one generation before Freud, and Freud we know read Nietzsche. Freud did his first major publication in uh, 1900, exactly 1900. I think the book actually came out in 1899 mm. toward the end of the year, but the publisher put 1900 on it because you know the new century and that's a little bit more more dramatic and so forth but this idea that there are deep uh, instinctual conflictual structures going on under the mind and that they come out in kind of a neurotic strange perverse form in our conscious minds and also that our conscious minds our, our reason our, our egos are relatively weak Johnny come lately evolutionary f uh, factors and so we can largely see that what we call reasoning really is just after the fact rationalization and that's not really uh, important to understand what the human being is and so we have to do these deep dives into some pretty dark subconscious unconscious below the surface uh, uh, places and then when you get down there uh, you find typically some some pretty dark stuff. Now, you no, know, in the Freudian version, he wants to reduce it more analytically to you know instinctual aggression and instinctual sexuality and kind of combining those two, you know, aggressive sexuality, uh, and that's that's a very reductionistic explanation. Nietzsche has a more sophisticated uh, version of it. He sees more varieties of forms for, for human beings, but it is true that that's where he's looking. And he wants to argue that for, for most people, uh, particularly for people who aren't that smart, for people who aren't that courageous, uh, people who uh, are much more conformist, uh, you know, kind of the, their, their natural whatever it is that makes them a human being, they don't feel able to or willing to express that and to discover mm. who they are. So a lot of stuff gets driven down. Uh, inside of them, and uh, they, they can't admit even to themselves that they are not being human beings and, and realizing their potential. Right. So, uh, in addition to whatever is just this natural, instinctual, seething stuff that's going to be going on, and with all of the conflicts and so forth, a lot of people uh, are, are are going to be uh, kind of kind of oppressed. I don't want to use this language too freightedly right now, by social conformist forces, and so it's, it's going to be pushed down under them. But they're also going to do a lot of repressing themselves. And so there's going to be a lot of dark, nasty territory that comes out there. And now this uh, then becomes you know, a little bit uh, uh, more of a sociological claim, but Nietzsche wants to argue that the vast majority of people don't have what it takes, really, to take any sort of human potentiality that they have and do something significant with it. Right? Uh, so instead they are going to be vacillating weak types of people and they're going to be worried about the, what their neighbors think about them and just you know hoping 
that uh, they can get along with their uh, you know, with their bosses and their mothers in law right and and so forth and that's just 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 the way they are but they still are human beings right and all of that uh, natural energy that human beings have is just going to be seething inside and it's going to eventually come out in ugly forms in envies and resentments and petty passive aggressiveness and so on and he's just a brilliant diagnostician right of a lot of the forms in which this uh, this can take. So he has a borrow word here, the ressentiment, which is not really the English resentment, but it's kind of in the in the same way. So just you have to think of yourself as a kind of a weak person, right? I don't know, you you, you could never stand up to your mom or your dad, right? And uh, but you always kind of resented it and you kind of didn't like yourself because you never quite stood up to your mom and dad, right? And maybe you're still, we're painting a stereotype here, you know, you're 28 years old and you're still living in your mom's basement, right? And <laughs> 38 uh, nowadays, but you know, <laughs> okay, whatever your age is. Right? <laughs> and you're, uh, and you didn't really uh, find anything that you were passionate about in, in high school. So you didn't really get any marketable skills. And so you got some sort of dead end job and uh, the boss, makes you do all kinds of stuff and you, you you really hate your work and you feel that it's dehumanizing but you don't really have enough ambition to you're oppressed do it. well you uh, but that's going to be your one of your cover stories yeah that's right? your cover story that's right that i'm that i'm oppressed you know it was the system it was my bad parenting yeah. it was you know it wasn't it, me it, it was capitalism didn't give me my my <laughs> hundred thousand dollar a year job that i know secretly that i'm really really deserving of yeah right, right so uh, all of those things though are going to be and uh, nietzsche is brilliant at diagnosing these things you know he talks about socialists right he talks about anti-semites and he talks about <laughs> the 1970 uh, uh, 19th century equivalent of you know the 30 year old still living in their mom's basements uh, in all of these forms so you will know really that it was your weakness that has led you to be this pathetic loser of a man. But it's very hard for people to admit to themselves that it's their own weakness that made them the pathetic losers that they are. Right? Uh, and so they will start inventing rationalizations and cover stories and so forth. And they'll have to invest a lot of energy to protect any minimal vest vestige of, of self-esteem that they can have that it's not me. Right? It's it's something out there, right, in the in the system and so forth. Now, where the resentment is really going to come out, though, is whenever they see somebody who's not a pathetic loser, right? <laughs> they see somebody right driving along in his. Well, I can't use an anachronistic example, right? Uh, you know, instead of having to walk to work, this guy's going along in a beautiful carriage, right, pulled by four horses. Right? The and horses' then, names are Ferrari. <laughs> the horses' names are Ferrari and Lamborghini and uh, right and so forth. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> all cool Italian names. Yeah. right? that's right. And so you hate that guy. Yep. That's right. And uh, here's another guy over there, right, who has a beautiful woman on his arm, and he's off to the opera, right, or or whatever, and he's dressed well. And meanwhile, you are right doing whatever. That person, even though if you don't know that guy, you hate him. Right? Mm -hmm. Because he's a living example and a living show. He's a, a he's pointing out to you uh, your failure, and you can't stand that because it smashes the self-image that you're trying to uh, trying to create. And so, what you necessarily then want to do is you have to smash that. You want that to go away in any way that and a lot of times it's going to come out just in you're going to mutter to yourself oh he got lucky he came mm -hmm. from the right it's all the game is rigged etc cetera, etc cetera. but then of course uh, uh, if you have a way with words you'll become very clever with words and find ways to insult this person and spread rumors about the person and and so on uh, so that all of that ressentiment uh, is what Nietzsche is very good at at diagnosing and we see a certain amount of that picked up by uh, by Freud. Interestingly, Nietzsche is a contemporary of Dostoevsky, the right. great Russian novelist who also is oh. brilliant at diagnosing all of these dysfunctional psychological types. So a lot is going on in the psychological territory uh, as well. And I think you know, <laughs> as much as I disagree with Nietzsche fundamentally on all of his philosophical, he was a brilliant diagnostic diagnostician on a lot of the 
psychological pathologies that are still with us, as we know. Now, you started off by talking about power. Mm. So if you're a social engineer or you're someone who's in on the cusp of a new age and so forth, and you're thinking of how can we construct power, how can we leverage power and so forth? And Marx is pointing out some of the same things as well in terms of those that are the haves and haves not have nots, the, the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and so forth. And if you're thinking about how I can leverage the right amount of those that have the resentment. Oh, sure. Yes, that's right. So uh, then uh, if you just are a political player, even if you don't buy into any sort of Kantian or Hegelian philosophical framework. You can just be an old-fashioned right, person who wants power for the sake of power. Nonetheless, you will recognize that there are different paths to power. And uh, certainly if we are in a more egalitarian and or more democratic and or more individualistic age where we are aspiring to right, empower lots and lots of people, uh, there are then going to be different constituencies that you can tap into. So. Uh, you know, yeah, one thing you can do is to say, I'm, I'm interested in people who have a lot of money or people who already have a certain amount of social clout or a certain amount of uh, aesthetic standing in the, in the society. I want to be one of the, the beautiful people. Hmm. Uh, so there are different routes to power as well. But yeah, as we know, there are various kinds of underclasses, uh, some of them constituted by raisonnement in a fairly dark form. And if you can in some way organize them or tap into their energy, they can be a power base for yes. you, or at least one of you. You don't necessarily have to believe in that official ideology, but you can use them uh, for your own political purposes. Mm. So as we then look at these different figures, and then what, what is it that, that really elevated Marx uh, as really being the one, that, especially as we would look back today, he's the one that everybody refers to. What is it that that is the is it, is it a delivery mechanism and so forth? Or is there something else that really uh, pushes Marx in terms of being the one who is the the constructionist of the revolutionary model? Yeah, I don't think there's any one thing here. I mean, you know, Marxism again is uh, it's not first rate, but it has a certain degree of sophistication. Uh, and so, if you just, for example, focus on the economic aspect right, of, of his philosophy. He does tell a, a, a relatively simple story about how economies work, and it's a story that can be packaged and has some, some appeal to people who don't know very much about economics. So you can, you know, for example, say, here I am, I'm a person and I have worked very hard. And, you know, I'm out there working 12 hours a day and I'm not making very much money. That doesn't seem right to me. Right? Right? And so there's a natural thing. And then I see some other guy, it doesn't seem like he's working very hard, and nonetheless he's got you know, a million Deutschmarks. Then right? somehow working hard should lead to prosperity, but I've worked hard and it didn't get me there. Right. It doesn't seem to me like he worked very hard. Therefore, there's an injustice in the system. Mm. You can take that ball and run with it and make right. a story that's going to be appealing to lots and lots of, uh, lots of people. So there's, uh, there's that. Uh, there also, of course, I think is this, the standard thing that in the 19th century, there was a lot of cronyism, of crony socialism, crony capitalism, crony feudalism, because the 19th century is, is developing. Cronyism is obviously an injustice. Uh, you don't have to have <laughs> a deep moral theory to see something wrong yeah. with cronyism. And cronyism, to the extent that it is out there, is uh, something that uh, you can point out to lots and lots of people. And, and if you are then successful in marshalling the the natural resentment against the cronyism and bringing that into your movement, then you, you once again will have a have a power base. So that I think is a more justified one. Uh, one of the things that the the, uh, the Marxist organizers of the 19th century and the 20th century used very very effectively, uh, and that was perfectly perfectly legitimate. I think a certain amount of it uh, uh, did come down to Marxism does. Uh, uh, have a psychological component. I think there are people who hate 
uh, people who are better than them and are more, more motivated, not so much by raising up the poor, but uh, to bring down their betters. Last time I know we were talking about Rousseau, I think when you read Rousseau, He's a very clear case of someone yes. who's not interested really in helping the poor, right. but who hates the, the rich and wants to bring them down. And this is a, this is a chronic theme, I think, in certain forms of left thought. Uh, and Marxism uh, takes a lot of that psychological antipathy to anybody who seems to be extraordinarily successful in their life. And they just hate those people and want to, want to bring them down. But you can't, of course, tell yourself that you're just motivated by hate and you want to destroy right. uh, something good. You have to have a rationalization for that. And Marxism does provide a, a rationalization for that. Now, beyond that, though, I do think uh, there's also just a, a certain level of historical accidentalness, right? That uh, you know, Marxism could have gone the way of all sorts of uh, socialist philosophies of the of the 19th century you know there were, were dozens and dozens of prominent versions of socialism kicking around in the 19th century sometimes it comes down to uh, you know this particular guy that happens to you know read this or pull this particular book off the shelf at the library instead of the neighboring book off the shelf and he's primed to uh, to find something inspiring that pushes his buttons and it happens to be Marx that he read rather than Saint-Simon Right, rather than Fourier and so on. Uh, in the case, I think, of Lenin, I think it's important, uh, uh, you know, Lenin, I think, had a dark psychology from the beginning, but uh, his older brother was part of a revolutionary cell fighting against Tsarist Russia, and the Tsarist secret police was <laughs> not a yeah. friend to uh, humanism or, <laughs> or, or morality, uh, shall, we, shall we say. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as perhaps you could argue that uh, uh, Lenin's older brother was not a good guy, if you want to shake things out, but he was brutally treated and, and, uh, and, and killed. And Lenin's the younger brother, and so you have, you know, sibling revenge psychology mm. uh, combined with his, uh, his intelligence, combined with his hatred-oriented psychology. And in that case, it comes to be profoundly motivating for him Riven. to say, I'm going to take right. on Tsarist Russia and do so. You know? yep. So, you know, if, if the Tsarist secret police had been a little less competent, if they had sent him to Siberia instead of executing him, would Lenin have been as, as, as vicious and committed as he, as, as he otherwise would have been? Mm. I can't say. So I think mm. to some extent there are historically unpredictable features as well. So if we were to take a look at several historical events in the late 19th century and then the early 20th century, we would see um, Fabian socialism, gradualism, Marxist gradualism, if you will, beginning in the late 18th century, then codifying itself in the early 20th century uh, in the Labour Party and in the founding of the London School of Economics. You would see as well World War I, which completely restructured the world, at least in the Western Hemisphere, but as well, um, you know, in Asia as well. Uh, and then what happened with the Russian Revolution. Uh, then as well, you would see the results of, of colonialism of the late 18th, uh, as well as then through the 19th century, into the late 19th century, especially in some of the barbarism occurring in Rhodesia and so forth. And so with all of these different geopolitical events happening um, and things beginning to move into shape and so forth, um, and then with, with Japan accepting some degree of modernity, uh, in terms of the, the building of their military and so forth, but yet somehow still clinging Sorry, to... in the case of Japan, are you not going to post-1945? Yes, I am. Okay. Go, or, or no, actually earlier, you know, with, with, the, with Japanese imperialism and so forth, okay. and basically trying to keep up with things. But when you, when you look at um, really what was happening, especially within Western civilization, that all of these events kind of occurring at one time, and... Where is it that then the major movements became, um, you know, very much set against each other and there was a competition for power, especially as the monarchical concept began to completely get dissolved mm -hmm. at one point? <clears throat> I think that's a really hard question, right? And <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just summarize. But, but, but that's what we're here Those for, right? 60 to 80 years or so. 
if well, you could in a few. Let, let's kick through it a little bit, though. It's okay. It's, Let me try to gloss your question and see if this yes. is, is, is fair yeah. to to what you're asking. So, so, we've been talking philosophy and philosophers, and then movements that come, were coming out of philosophy, and now you're asking: here are various political movements, right? World War One, developments in Japan, World War Two, and and so forth. Uh, what's the relationship between yeah. large-scale politics and large-scale philosophy? Yes. Right. And then, of course, we can throw out some of the possibilities. One is to say that the politics is going along and philosophical movements are adapting themselves or responding in the wake of grand politics political happenings. So Correct. World War I happens for political, say, reasons, and then we find the philosophers after trying to grapple with what does World War I mean and what should we do about it. Now, the other way to then say it would be to say that the grand political events, though, are the playing out of intellectual movements uh, that have been developed prior to that, but those intellectual movements, say, are driven by earlier philosophical movements. Now, I like the, there's a quotation from Lord Bolingbroke here that, uh, that I think is 95% uh, true of modern history. And the quotation is, history is philosophy teaching by example. So that then is to say, the grand battles are philosophical battles, and the major historical events are instantiations of the philosophies, and then you see what that theoretical philosophy means in practice. And of course, what philosophy is doing, if you have a, you know, there are conflicts in, built into philosophy, it's a very arguey discipline. So I've got my philosophical system, you've got your philosophical system, they disagree with each other, so we have arguments. I try to critique yours and tear it down, you try to critique mine and we try to tear it down. Uh, to the extent that we are committed to reason, then we are going to let the better arguments prevail. And if, in fact, you can tear my philosophical system down, if I'm a committed to reason person, right. I will change my mind. Right. Right. And, and, and you, if you are committed to reason, will do the same thing. But if one of our philosophies fundamentally is not committed to reason, then I'm not going to accept your critiques. Instead, I'm still going to want to take my philosophy and put it into practice and live my philosophy. Uh, and you're going to want to live your philosophy, but in practice, they are going to be in conflict with each other. And if one or both of us is not willing to resolve our differences by reasonable means, translated into civil means, then that means we are going to have to sort our differences out by physical means. And mm. in the worst of the worst cases, that does mean war. Mm -hmm. So I think the important question then to say about World War I is going to be, uh, so for example, why were the French and the Germans pointing their weapons at each other mm -hmm. rather than the French pointing their weapons at the British? Right. right? So there re there's a reason why the, uh, before the war starts, the weapons are facing a certain way and have been facing each other a certain way for a, a generation or, or more. Uh, and the difference seems to be, but by the time you get to the early 20th century, France has become, by and large, a republic. It's a little more liberal, and you know, we have to put quotations or marks around there, mm -hmm. but it's more republican, it's more democratic, mm -hmm. it's more liberal, it's more open to international trade, it's uh, industrialized, uh, and, and so forth, open markets, right, and so forth. And the same thing has happened with respect to the British. And so uh, they are more natural allies culturally. But the Germans, <laughs> they have modernized in a certain way, yes. but they are listening to Hegel, they're listening to Marx, they're listening to Nietzsche, they're listening to other people we've not spoken of, like Treitschke and others, and they are not open to republicanism, liberalism, democracy, and so forth. They are open to Germany has a divine or a quasi-providential mission to impose Top its down. way upon the world, right? It's an authoritarian, heavily militaristic structure, and uh, the German way of doing things is different from the French way of doing things, and we can't 
we can't uh, we can't mix. And so you find uh, the British, for example, in the 19th century saying, wow, <clears throat> what we've learned is it seems like if we put away the guns and start trading with each other, we all become rich. Right? <laughs> and so we have the, the, uh, the capitalist peace thesis. And mm -hmm. it's very interesting when you read the, the literature mm -hmm. of the late 1800s, they started saying things like, you know, we haven't had a war for a while. Right? That's kind mm -hmm. of weird. The Belle Epoque, the beautiful age. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yes. you know, we, we finished with Napoleon in 1815. Right. And now we're getting into the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Maybe war is a thing of the past. Yeah. As we've all become liberal, democratic. Right. And so John Stuart Mill and Richard Cobden and, and Bright and so forth are saying that commerce, gentle commerce, it brings international peace because if we're all trading with each other and getting rich, well, you know, you know, if you're in a different country, but you're my vendor and you're sending me a million pounds worth of goods a year, I don't want to go to war with your country because that's right. going to cost me a certain amount of country. Right? And if you're a different country and I'm selling you a million pounds worth of stuff, I don't want to go to war with you. So capitalism is is, is making people mm -hmm. into into peaceful traders, uh, and this is great, right? Yeah. Because right. we want world peace and we want liberal peace and. Uh, and, and so forth. But then you read simultaneously what the Germans right, are saying. <laughs> now, there were some liberal Germans and there were some free market capitalist types of Germans as well, but they're a tiny, tiny minority. The dominant voices are that, uh, uh, you know, peace is, uh, uh, is, is just uh, something that makes people weak. Manly men like to fight, right? You need to be vir virile. Right? We don't want to have a nature, uh, you know, a nation of uh, shopkeepers, right? You know, there you can go, and this is the English aspiration. You know, you can be a good boy and go to school and get nice marks and then get a job at your dad's hardware store. How inspiring, right? <laughs> or you can go out and have your own farm and stand behind a plow for the rest of your life. Mm. Be a nice shopkeeper. Be a no, mm. right? What does a real man do, right? A real man is a warrior, a real man is a fighter, right? So right. peace makes people soft, right? Right, And you know, there's something special right, about German. And so the fact that Hegel you know, has a very conflict model that Marx is all about violent revolution, right? Nietzsche is about the will to power, right? And so forth. It's all uh, hyper uh, testosterone, or for you, this is anachronistic language now, but hyper masculinity. And, uh, you know, so the idea that somehow uh, Germany should take the place, uh, become like the soft Westerners and so forth, no, we're not going to go there. It's a completely different ethos, a completely different uh, 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 political culture in place. So, of course, they have to be in conflict with each other. So, that's why World War I happens at the, at the philosophical level. Now, there's going to be then a hundred diplomatic issues that arise right. in the normal course of events, right? And, you know, which one of those is going to be a trigger? Uh, you can't predict any of that. But the, the point in point is going to be uh, nations that are committed to reason, peace, trade, democracy, republicanism, keeping uh, government powers relatively limited, and that, that we're really going to try to resolve things through diplomatic means, they're going to be pretty successful at doing so. Those from the philosophical get-go want to say conflict is how we resolve things, violence is the answer, peace is not worthy of manhood or nationhood. Uh, there, it's just a matter of time before some diplomatic incident that can't be resolved through diplomacy or some collection of them is just going to light the fuse and then you get into to World War I. Mm. So as we we start moving through into, we talked about Lenin, we, we basically, uh, we, we covered a bit of, of what happened during the Russian Revolution. But then as we get past World War I, we have what then became the Weimar Republic. Uh, just really devastation and and serious issues that are happening, and then kind of the um, the beginning of real resentment mm. in Germany. Then mm. we have the the birth both in Italy and in um, and in Germany of this idea of national socialism. Mm. So national socialism, as defined by um, uh, I think Ad Adolf Hitler made what 
comment about National Socialism? It's basically... Well, at various points, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Nazis or the National Socialists uh, and the Communists, and there are some other versions of uh, socialism, you know, they are uh, political enemies right, of each other. Uh, but uh, Hitler's point here was to say that philosophically or at the, the level of principles, we're both committed to the same general territory and so forth. Both of us are anti-liberal, anti-democratic, anti-republican. So there's more in common between the Nazis and the communists than there is different. So <clears throat> it would be, uh, you know, the, the analogy I, I typically think of is to say, you know, you've got two gangs, drug gangs in Los Angeles, you know, the, Bro the Bloods and the Crips. You know, mm -hmm. They are enemies of each other and they're going to be street fighting and right and so forth. But the, uh, you know, this is our turf, that's your turf, these are our people, these are, our, are, are, are your people. Uh, but they're committed to violence and criminal activity is the way of, or the way of doing business. And so if you just go up one level of abstraction, you would say both of us are committed to the same philosophy of life in mm -hmm. contrast to, say, you know, people who just want to be entrepreneurs or, or, or whatever, live a normal bourgeois suburban lifestyle and so forth. So mm. Hitler was smart enough to, to recognize that. Goebbels also was smart enough to recognize that. And lots of his, uh, you know, these are propaganda speeches, but he's explicitly writing pamphlets to be distributed in the communist neighborhoods saying, you know, uh, last time you voted communist and you voted communist because of X, Y, and Z, right, principles. Well, you know, we also believe in X, Y, and Z, right, but we also will give you these ones over here. Uh, so just come over to our side. And it's, 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 they thought it was an easy sell. And in mm -hmm. fact, it was an easy sell. You know, if you track the voting patterns of the people, the, the working people, you know, in one election, they are voting communist. In the next election, they are voting Nazi. And then they go back to communist, they go back to Nazi. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're never going to vote for the Social Democrats. They're never going to vote for the quasi-liberal parties as well. Mm. And so you have that happening uh, in Germany. You have this happening in Italy. Mm. And at the same time, now you have Russia transitioning out of Leninism into Stalinism. You have what happened in Ukraine, which so many people rush past. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. The, the horrible things that happened there. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a quick point about uh, what's happening in Italy, uh, you know, focusing clearly on, on Mussolini. And we do have this buffoonish understanding of, uh, of, of Mussolini and a certain amount of that, I think, is, is mm -hmm. justified. Because, uh, you know, he was no stranger to political theater and, uh, and, and partly in the Italian style and so on. But uh, I think it's important to remember that Mussolini was a card-carrying socialist of the Marxist variety until he was 35 years old. Mm -hmm. Absolute committed to the internationalist version of socialism. Workers of the world unite. Right. Right? So it's socialism, but uh, just standard internationalist class right, analysis and so forth. And just to backtrack to World War I a little bit, uh, it was a, a revelation to Mussolini in his thinking because uh, he was a, a true believer in Marxism and his analysis was World War I is just the international capitalist class uh, going to war and all the capitalist nations are going to fight against each other. And the workers in all of these countries are going to realize that their class enemies really are the capitalists. This is not their war. And so this is going to be a fine opportunity for class consciousness to arise and for the Marxist revolution to, to come up. And so he was to some extent shocked that what happened in World War I was the national identification of almost all of the workers in all of those countries. So the workers did not first and foremost think of themselves as members of an international economic class. They thought of themselves as Italians fighting against the French or fighting against the Germans. And the German workers are thinking of themselves as Germans. So for him, he is arguing it's socialism. That's absolutely right. But Marx got the collective wrong. The operative collective in mm. real life is not economic class. It's ethnic slash racial identity. Mm. And so for him, it was a very easy move from international socialism to national socialism. It's socialism for the Italian nation. It's the Italians as a community, as a collective, uh, that are the proper unit of political analysis, and they are in conflict with 
Uh, at some times, of course, they can be allied with the Germans, uh, but it's also the French and the Spanish, and that's the right way of looking looking at the world. So, um, that's Mussolini. So you you move into this idea of corporatism. Well, yes, and and, and also to to get away from Mussolini as a buffoonish guy, read his writings. He was you know he was a journalist. He had a way with words. Oh yeah. And he is teaming up with professional philosophers. You know, we have certified PhDs in philosophy at the best universities in uh, in Italy and so forth, co-authoring uh, manuscripts and so on. So there is a very well worked out theory, and of course they're drawing on Hegel, <laughs> Marx, <laughs> Nietzsche. These are all very well read individuals uh, and so forth. So the fascist philosophy it's explicitly anti individualistic, anti democratic, anti free market, anti capitalist. It's robust collectivism. Now you call it corporatism, and that's what it is going to say state management of the economy and all of the corporations, right, are just an organic function within the broader body politic that is overseen by Il Duce. It's autocratic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So about that same time, Antonio Gramsci comes along. Yeah. And, and maybe, Jim, what, what was Gramsci responding to and what was his... Well, I mean, the question at the time, as far as, as, far as I understand, is you have a lot of communists. And so Gramsci, like, like Mussolini, was, he was actually looking at the situation and he's looking at the Italian workers' parties and he's like, why, why won't they take this action? Why isn't this revolution coming? What's happening? Why, is the things, why are the things that Marx, since we're talking early 1920s or even late 19-teens, why are these things not coming to pass? And so he gets frustrated and he joins the International Communist Party. And so he's now in, in he's liaising with, with Lenin. He's warning Lenin about Stalin and getting rebuked for that. And he has this whole thing with that. And so then you, of course, you have the, 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 the juxtaposition here is that you have the Russian Revolution having, having succeeded. You had the attempted revolution in Hungary, which I say attempted, yeah. it succeeded temporarily six or eight or nine months or whatever, and it falls apart. The, you know, Lukács had, had kind of spearheaded. Yeah. This thing falls apart. And so now you have this question. Marx had predicted that the late industrial capitalism would bring forth through the dialectical materialism sufficient contradictions where the workers would realize their exploitation and then they would rise up, they would unify, they would recognize themselves as, as workers. And so you would expect under Marx's analysis that the revolutions would occur in major industrial centers, the most right. developed industrial centers, Bottom. London, Berlin, um, New York maybe, Chicago, Los Angeles, something like that. This is where they would, would, would emanate from. And that didn't happen. Peasant Russia, 80-85% peasants. Hungary, not exactly, you know, a industrial powerhouse, has something like a revolution that the Hungarians then push off. Um, nowhere else is any of this happening. Everybody else seems happy with capitalism. So he starts thinking in a new way. Something is holding all this together in these Western nations. Whether even that's Germany, whether that's Italy, whether that's Britain or France, something's holding them together. And he comes up with this idea of cultural hegemony, that the culture itself is pushing, the culture itself becomes a repository of the correct values that people that keep people happy and keep people thinking that that they don't need a revolution. A revolution isn't actually that great of an idea, uh, and that those values are the things that then have to be questioned. So this is, in some sense, him looking. And this is, of course, getting a bit later. We're talking about Gramsci before he goes to prison and kind of blending it with Gramsci after he goes to prison. 1926, Mussolini threw his communist butt in prison. Um, they said we we're going to put him in prison for 20 years to stop his brain working. And <laughs> they got 11 of those years and then he died. Yeah, but his brain yeah. didn't stop working. He wrote over 3,000 pages, the way we typically publish them now in what's called his prison notebooks, in which he lays out this incredibly robust, incredibly um, articulate analysis of how culture upholds the values uh, that seem to repel the idea of people wanting revolutions, and in particular, a transition to communism. Uh, and so you have Gramsci identifying cultural institutions then that have, that they, they all kind of mesh together to create this cultural hegemony, the way people perceive things are, and that has this sort of soft power that holds everything together and keeps out 
the revolutionary spirit. And he says, that we, well, we have to get into those. And he names five in particular, family, faith, uh, education, media, and law. And we have to enter into, whether it's religion, where he says that socialism is precisely the religion that must uh, overwhelm Christianity, you know, whether it's the family structure, so now we have to question what the family is supposed to look like, whether it's education, we need this educated worker, the educated, the working class intellectual he was talking about, got very interested in how you might create um, kind of revolutionary education for the working class, whether it's in media or whether that's in law, uh, you know, different thoughts about how do we enter these cultural institutions and change them from within with a counter hegemony inside the institution and thus erupt out a whole new culture from inside the culture, which of course is going to harken back to Nietzsche's idea that he expresses in genealogy of morals with the slave morality, corrupting from underneath the values of those that are keeping them in power. You're not allowed to say slave morality and master morality anymore, but that's, that's the way it was written at the time. Um, so you have all of these ideas. I'm going to keep saying slave morality and master morality, well, by the way. Because it's what he said. That's right. What, yeah. So, you know, we're going to corrupt the values from within and have this whole new model. And so here we have this birth of, of cultural Marxism, but also the idea that power is located culturally. So mm. Marx was very interested in power being located in economics. Hegel was very interested in power being located in the ideas expressed through the state. And now we have this idea that, no, there's this cultural phenomenon that we have to look into. And this is, this is really, you know, a very poignant insight by Gramsci that much later Andrew Breitbart summarized in a much more kind of tactile phrase is that, you know, politics is downstream from culture. It's kind of a just summary of that concept. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to control the political environment, you have to somehow influence the culture first in which that arises. So Gramsci becomes very relevant at this point. And then you see this dramatic shift in terms of how communist oriented thinking is going to going to proceed. It's, it, it, something is wrong with the with the seize the means of economic production model and there needs instead to be a seizing of the cultural production, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's you know faith, family, education, media, or law, or whatever other institutions have lots of cultural salience. And you start seeing a lot more interest in that. And of course, Gramsci talked with the, the, the founders of the Frankfurt School before they founded the Frankfurt School, um, or as they were founding it. And so some of those ideas were leaking into what became the, the critical theory tradition or the neo-Marxist tradition that arose up within that. And so you have this whole new analysis going on, shifting the focus from economics or from even necessar not necessarily the nation, but into this, what are cultures and how are cultures relevant? How, does, how do the, the mores of culture produce power that w keeps people you know, satisfied with their situation, not wanting to uh, dip into necessarily you know, a revolutionary spirit or even that will to power that they should have that would, would, would awaken if they were just more aware of how they're being kind of screwed over by the world. So then we, we have this, this moment in history that, that at the time, because it was rather contained, maybe would have seemed to the powers of the world to be somewhat irrelevant you know, uh, because you have a man who's in prison, you have this institute beginning in Frankfurt, and these ideas that are beginning to become codified and so forth, really that are, are doctrinal in nature and so forth. And Stephen, kind of what, where do we go then? You've got your goofy Fabians writing plays and things too, uh, right? Well, actually, uh, you know, and the thing is, is that you, you could say with your goofy Fabians, um, is that a lot of the ideas that are expressed in a prison in Italy, and in a school in Frankfurt are somewhat on the same track with where in a much more erudite fashion are being expressed in Fabian tracks in Britain. And then as well are beginning to be um, spoken about in, in Washington DC and New York. Um, so there's this kind of concurrent thing that might be happening, but it's not fully there yet. But, but Stephen, where, where would you kind of pick things up as we then start to go through this era? Yeah. Well, I frankly see a disjunction between the Fabian approach and the, uh, the, the cultural Marxism yes, and the yes. neo-Marxism that are going on. The Fabians, you know, for all of their disgustingness, they're still British and they're saying right, we're not going to go right. through 
uh, revolutionary violence and so forth. Right. Right. Uh, Gradualism. And that's right. And they still dripping. have enough of a faith in the common man that through mm -hmm. the goofy plays, perhaps, and other kinds of pamphlets and meetings, we can educate people yeah. to uh, to rise up and bring socialism in a, in a, in a proper kind of fashion. So it is the it's uh, a pinky up proper. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. That, that's yeah. right. But it's, it's very it's, respectable. It's going to be a little rougher. Uh, around the edges, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, coming from a different cultural sector. Uh, one element of the the, the shift from uh, kind of classical Marxism on the continent into a more cultural Marxist approach is going to be a complete loss of faith in the powers of the common man or the working man, because you know, as James is explaining. That person has been totally constructed by the powers that be. Uh, and uh, you know, we might say that person's been bought off uh, by the creature comforts of liberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably the person is not even articulate and self-aware enough to realize that they've been bought off. They've just been recreated. Now, this but, is really where the idea of false consciousness is. Exactly, enters. that's right. Marx is often credited with that, but I think he only, the term between he and Engels mm. was only once or twice that it appeared. Yeah. It was a, it was not a concept he was... Well, it becomes, yeah, certainly much more explicitly articulated at this point, and in part due to Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, and Freud, the development of the, a more sophisticated early modern psychology. You'll start looking inside right. the person instead of just to external social, economic, political conditions to explain what's going on. So the uh, you know the, the working class, the common people, they've been bought off. They, you know, they believe that the exploitation and the alienation and the oppression is still all there, and it's supposed to be manifesting itself according to classical Marxism. So the only explanation is that somehow it's been driven underground, deep underground, uh, and it's going to then take the critically trained theorist to be able to spot the underground oppression, exploitation, right, and so forth. Uh, and so the shift is going to be from the, the revolution being brought about not by the working class and not necessarily by a political vanguard on the order of Lenin or Stalin or Trotsky or a little bit later Mao, but it's going to be the intellectuals, right? because it's the intellectuals who have the cultural analytical skills. That those are the ones who are going to be the new vanguard. So it starts to become a much more highbrow movement, and to a large extent divorced from uh, mainstream culture and, and relegated to highbrow cultural institutions. Which matches with their dis disgust of I mean, the, the, their view is almost that middle culture, or if you will, or popular culture, was one of the brainwashing entities mm. that was buying people off. Oh, you have well, later, I guess, you have your sports to watch, or you have your, sure, that's you right. have your, you know, your consumer products. You, you know, got you beer in the fridge, beer in the fridge, meat in the can, television, television, radio before that, yep. and you know, it's feeding you if you're Theodore Adorno, it's th feeding you crap jazz and rock and roll and not. You know, probably Wagner or something. Um, That's right. Yeah. And you can go to the to the movies. Uh, to the right? movies, yeah. They yeah, didn't so like the you, movies. That's right. And yeah, yeah, yeah lowbrow movies. So, so it's both the middle class bourgeoisie and the lower class. And even, uh, you know, with the development of a welfare state, even the worst of the worst are being looked after. So... The, the, the two, yeah. the Almost so, the Keynesian development in economics, which has its own... You know, it's its own gigantic conversation, but that is making it such that people have, you know, are, they're being taken care of and things aren't horrific. And all of a sudden, you know, the terrible exploiting class is no longer able to be driven to the point where the, or, the, or I should say the exploited class is no longer being driven to the point of extreme exploitation that'll bring the revolutionary will out. So there's you're being bought off by a system that's actually figuring out how to solve Problems right. within and the capitalist and is system. Actually, making progress. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But no, that progress is bad because it steals that revolutionary will. That's right, and, and that's because you have a prior philosophical commitment to uh, an anti-liberal, anti-rational, anti-individualist commitment. That's axiomatic. Mm. So you get into further mental gymnastics, to put it pejoratively, to preserve your underlying commitment to that system. But because these guys are very sharp, 
they can do those mental gymnastics and come up with new wrinkles and new iterations. Mm, so at about this time you have then, let's, let, as we move past World War II, and, it, and I hate to gloss over all of this, but to just kind of move the, the consequences of ideas forward, is that you then have, you know, during World War II, the Frankfurt School moves then to the United States. For they didn't the most go part. to Moscow. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That's right. That's that's good. Uh, and th at the same time, you have uh, you have George Bernard Shaw, you know, heading over to New York as well and lecturing and so forth in the United States and kind of blending that kind of understanding of, of Fabianism and, and so forth. And then at the end of World War II, the, the defeat of of fascism, of National Socialism and so forth, uh, really the strengthening of Stalinism and Marxism. And then you have the, um, you have then Mao, then with the revolution in China. So you have all these things happening. Um, and, and of course, we can't run past what happened with Mao, because that was a really emboldened steroidal form of many of the horrible ideas that we've we've just discussed now mm -hmm. not only of marx but of others mm -hmm. and really hegemonic mm. in nature too. it was also the the first one of these revolutions it was primarily driven culturally you know he attempted yes. the material with the great leap forward and this turned into a catastrophe utter catastrophe people dying you take all the farmers and tell them that they have to make steel and they can't make steel because they're farmers Many of them are just peasant, uneducated peasant farmers, so they end up making tons and tons and tons, untold tons of pig iron that you can't use for anything. Meanwhile, you're not growing any food, so people are starving. The, the Great Leap Forward, which was predicated off of Mao's fairly unsophisticated idea that if whatever country is making the most steel is the most advanced country, um, that's, that, that was a tremendous failure. So they drive him out of power, mm -hmm. they chase him away, and he comes back with a cultural revolution to destroy right. his enemies. And so now you have, you know, the Red Guard coming and you have the children attacking their parents and the children attacking their grandparents and their teachers. But the main objective is to destroy the four olds of culture, old culture, old habits, old, what is it? Customs, habits, cultures, ways Religion. of thinking yep. or something like this. Yep. And so they're going into the temples and they're smashing things and they're destroying. I think the Lama Temple um, is one of the few things that wasn't. It still has, you know, eighth and ninth century treasures um, mm -hmm. in Beijing. They're destroying these things. They're trying to rip up, whether it's in the educational sphere, whether it's in, you know, the artistic sphere, whether it's for, from my own, you know, studying a Chinese martial arts from my own history, they, you know, they, they took all of the old Chinese medicine practitioners because that's an old thing. That's old China. That's not modern. That's not new. They took all the Chinese martial arts, all the Chinese medical practitioners and they either drove them out. Most of them went to Taiwan or got killed. A few of them went underground. And then, you know, a few years later, he comes back and says, no, that's great. The West is interested in this. And they open it, they bring it back in and charlatans flood the empty space uh, by creating this kind of artificial condition. Um, but the, the goal is to destroy the old culture and invent an entirely new culture. So with Mao, you have the first real attempt. I mean, there's a, and I wish I could remember which philosopher wrote this, and I, I do this too frequently, but the, the, the phrase was, Mao did what Gramsci thought. Whether he knew, whether Mao knew Gramsci or not is unclear to me. Hmm. It's certainly possible. The prison notebooks were smuggled out by 1930. He died in 1937, and by later 1937, they were in Moscow. And so the Third International Communist Party had them by 1937, so Mao could have had access to them. Uh, I don't know if he did, but he, in, he took the fight to the cultural level after the economic level fell apart. And so this represents something new. So now over here, we say in the United States, we have the Frankfurt School. You have these guys looking at Mao and they're like, oh, the, you see this in Marcuse's writings, the revolution in China is going great, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and in the 1960s, uh, Michel Foucault right, uh, declares himself a Maoist. Right? Yeah, exactly right. this point. And it also at the same time, Rudy Deutschke is laying out the long march through the institutions, which he modeled off of what Mao's Cultural Revolution did, starting in what he was 66 through 76 as the Cultural Revolution. And so you have all these guys, they were, they were the, the, the postmodernists were looking off at China and thinking, how great. You know, of course, this is probably largely in ignorance. 
China wasn't telling probably much of the true story. Um, but this is this was the the mood, whether it's within you know Marcuse going into Angela Davis uh, in the 1960s, or whether that's Foucault and his his other French friends looking into. They're all saying, "Oh, what Mao's doing is working. What Mao's doing is." Was wonderful, and that was a, that was really the first proper cultural revolution. Right. Well, can we yeah. can we back up like 10, 15 years, and then so Stalin dies, right? And then Good all of a sudden, some truth is being told uh, about the actual condition in the Soviet mm -hmm, Union. Mm -hmm. What does that do to a lot of young Marxists, especially in mm. France and some other places? <clears throat> well, aside from the uh, the leftists who had evolved into various forms of neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism and so on, there still was a huge contingent of true believer classical Marxists. That The Soviet Union, led first by Lenin and then by Stalin, was showing the world the proper way. And that all of these deviant, bad neo-Marxists and so on, they are, they're bad people and we read them, we read them out of the moment. So the true believer mentality uh, uh, has a huge demographic uh, it, all across Western Europe. Uh, this is uh, post Iron Curtain going up and certainly all across North America and, uh, and, and through the, the English speaking world and a big following also in, uh, in Latin America as well. So the events of 1956, so Stalin dies in 53, takes a couple of years for Khrushchev to consolidate his power. Uh, and one of the ways of, for him to consolidate his power is to, uh, to, uh, to reveal publicly, uh, in, a, in a speech meant to be publicized for world consumption, uh, Stalin's horrific genocides, crimes, just general butchery uh, uh, and economic mismanagement yes, and so on. Because then uh, those, uh, after Stalin's death, those political competitors for Khrushchev who are still wanting to toe the Stalinist line, they then become politically weakened and that helps Khrushchev solidify his own his own power. Not to take you off on a diversion, but you do know there's a Russian joke about this, right? Uh, an old Russian joke. I'm sure and, there's more than one. Well, the, the, it's a very famous one and it goes like this, if, if you've never heard it. Um, Khrushchev is having a particularly difficult day. Things are getting a bit rough for him. So he goes in back to his office, locks the door, and he opens the secret drawer in his desk and he insides an envelope from Stalin and he opens the envelope and inside there are two notes numbered one and two at the top so he pulls out number one and it says to consolidate your power blame your predecessor <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes out and he blames Stalin and he tells all of Stalin's secrets etc and things work for a little while and then they start to fall apart again so he comes back in and he opens the secret drawer and he pulls out n note number two and it says Write two notes <laughs> to your successor. <laughs> there we go. All right. That so, actually was new to me, so thanks for that. That's a, that's a good joke. So you, you're in this age now where you have... It was 1956. Yes, right. That's right. So the, the question then, and here we're, you know, we're talking about Mao and what's going on in the Soviet Union, but uh, I, I think the story we want to tell is going to be Western Europe and then in North America as if we're going to get to postmodernism. So the, the revelation of Stalin's crimes by the then leader of the Soviet Union is a bombshell among hard left circles. Now, you have all the usual denialist, denialist things. It's got to be CIA propaganda and this, that, and the other thing. But very quickly, it becomes clear that Stalin was a monster. Uh, that the socialism and the Soviet Union, you know, even if you're a classical Marxist, you're really supposed to be caring about the poor and the downtrodden and lifting people up. That does not square with genocide and, uh, and on all the just incredibly horrible things that uh, the so-called humane communists were doing to their, to their own people. And then also uh, all of the, uh, the economic mismanagement, the, the faith that somehow once socialism with proper industrialization and central management, it's going to be outperform or outperforming capitalism with all of its chaotic, you know, making gadgets and, uh, and and silly consumer products and so forth. The abysmal failures of the Soviet economic model, all of that is very public and it's undeniable. So total crisis of faith for 
the, uh, the remaining number of true believer, hardcore, classical Marxists. So you read the literature of 1956 and 1957, it's, uh, it's, it's very clear. The, the, the soul-seeking and the anguish about what to do with this, and, and fairly quickly you see them you know, splintering and going off in various neo-Marxist directions, uh, some of them just giving up in despair, uh, some of them kind of repackaging themselves as more moderate people in the middle, right, and so on. So what had been a rather still dominant uh, classically Marxist intellectual movement loses all of its steam and starts to splinter in, in various moments. Uh, also, of course, 1956, that's when the uh, Hungarian protests had been occurring. Right. And uh, there, the important thing is that this is the first uh, few years of international television. And so everybody, millions of people worldwide, are able to see for their own eyes. It's not CIA propaganda. Right? Those are actually right, Soviet tanks. Uh, uh, those are actual students, Hungarian students, Hungarian workers, making their protests civilly, and the reaction of the so-called, you know, moral, humane, communist government taking orders from Moscow is send in the troops, arrest the people, torture them, send in the tanks, and so on. So, the true brutality of Soviet communism was was then apparent. So, 1956 devastating year for, for, for communism. So at that point, the old left, uh, I think, is dead. And that's why by mm -hmm. the time we get into the 1960s, the left has reinvented itself in various ways. And we start talking about the new left, and it's all you know shiny and to some extent kumbaya and folk songs and mm -hmm. lots of different movements and, and so forth in, uh, in Western Europe and, and North America. Very emotion-driven. Well, yes, it's going to be emotion-driven, in part uh, due to the abstract philosophy as it's come down. Philosophy is at a very skeptical place at this moment as well. But even within classical Marxism, there still is some respect for a kind of reason and a kind of science. You know, because the Marxists, the classical Marxists, are saying we are scientific socialists. We are doing social science. We are saying there are laws of economic development, and if you understand the way things really work, we can make predictions. And the problem then is all of the social science predictions mm -hmm. fail. They fail obviously, and so at that point, you, have, uh, 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 you either have to say, okay, I'm going to give up on my, my leftism and my socialism and go somewhere else, or you have to say, so much for science. And mm. a lot of leftism says so much for science, so much for reason. We are going to go in a much more passional, emotionalist, right, commitment-oriented direction. And so all of the developments coming out of, you know, Kierkegaardian commitment and Nietzschean embrace and existentialist authenticity, all of those non-rational and anti-rational epistemologies coming along are feeding in to the, the irrationalist direction that uh, 1960s leftism took. So we, we kind of flow from modernism then into well, yes, or, or the remnants of modernism in some segments of the left are basically abandoned. Right. And so we get into post-modernism. Post-modernism, that's right. Yes. That's right. So the entire modernist project, uh, and again, the modernist project had been largely the Enlightenment, and the counter-Enlightenment thinkers like you know, uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Hegel, on my interpretation, these are all anti-enlightenment, counter-enlightenment thinkers. It's the chickens coming home to roost several generations later. Mm. Uh, Frankfurt School, critique of the enlightenment, right? the, uh, uh, the existentialist, all anti-enlightenment. So yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. a counter-enlightenment intellectual decade in kind of Americanized, Western Europeanized, hippieized, various strands of new left form. Uh, it's becoming a popular movement at that point, no longer just the intellectuals as it had been the generation before. So you have thinkers now that are in, that are in this postmodern line of thought, Lyotard, uh, Foucault, Derrida, and then at the same time, during the 1960s, you have one-dimensional man, um, Eros and Civilization and so forth with Marcusa, and then his boldness coming through at the same time and, and 
you know, they're not the same thing, but... No. Well, I mean, in the American context, we don't have a conflict here yet. Because One Dimensional Man is 1964. In the 1964 to 1965 year, it sold some 300,000 copies, if I read correctly. Which means it was an incredibly popular, incredibly influential book. And here he's talking about, he's now shifted to talking about how consumerism, in particular, flattens society down into a single dimension. A single dimension of experience, which is dictated, it feels like it's not necessarily one-dimensional because it's dictated by all these heteronymous interests, the advertisers, your boss, all of the different aspects of living in a capitalist consumer society that are pulling you this way and that way. Oh, you know, buy our product, watch our, watch our show, listen to this, participate in that, show up to this, you know, so you're being, for him, you know, he's now preaching kind of a gospel of you don't, you don't even know who you are or what's going on around you because you're you're the product of all these heteronymous interests that want you to buy things. Uh, heteronymous, of course, being, you know, from, from many other sources, like the opposite of autonomy is heteronomy. And so he's, he's all these other external forces are telling you, you're shaping your life for you. And he says that, you know, goes on to say that you can't even think for yourself in this kind of a condition. Mm. You have to actually be aware of this. You have to be able to become critical of this before you can even begin to think for yourself. And so this is kind of the, the, the milieu in which he ends up. And in that book, he mentions false consciousness repeatedly over a dozen times, maybe, maybe two dozen times. Uh, this is the milieu in which the next year he writes Repressive Tolerance, where he starts trying to examine how these, these, these heteronymous interests have an influence on your life and what can you do about them? Well, he talks about how revolutionary movements have this, but the problem is that with reactionary, which is everything that's not what resists this uh, capitalist, consumerist, hegemonic situation people find themselves in that robs them of their autonomy, robs them of their ability to think, robs them of their own opinions, robs them of their own uh, direction in life. Uh, in response to that, what you have to do is you, he says, he says that you have to stop the thought before it enters. And he says, to be sure, this is censorship, even pre-censorship but it's necessary. Hmm. So you have this very authoritarian mindset at the level of, of really cognition. Not even, it's not even about free speech because he's talking about pre-censorship. He says that the idea has to be stopped before it can get in. And of course he frames us all kind of as, as Stephen was, was saying, that the, but at this point, you know, we have to go back two decades to the, the publication of the Dialectic of Enlightenment. But you see here the Enlightenment in that book, the thesis broadly is the Enlightenment itself, rationality becomes irrationality uh, through the various ways that power corrupts the way that people think and the way that they're rational. So that this this is what's going into um, his critique is that the in the post-fascistic era in this you know this era that we're living in in the 1960s fascism is about to break out at any moment and that's how he rationalizes this need to awaken people to the fact that all these outside forces are pulling their strings because you, and we have to censor and pre-censor because you never know which one of them is going to spark fascism and so he's got this very censorious very uh, unbalanced view you know we have to it, it, he even says quite literally we must extend tolerance repressive or liberating or discriminating tolerance he calls them all three has to repress movements well, has to tolerate movements from the left and offer no tolerance to movements from the right where he defines left and right in in, in these frames <laughs> so that's a, in with a different line of thought than postmodernism. Uh, but yes it is that's right yeah so uh, it's also congruent with the development of counterculture and an endorsement of counterculture because if the idea is the, the organs of bourgeois capitalist culture have become so uh, omnipresent and so controlling that all of the official organs of culture have suffocated yes. genuine consciousness then how do we get past this false consciousness? Right. And we can't do it by playing within the system. We can't uh, uh, just join the culture and, and fight it that way. Instead, what we need to do is become counter culture. Yep. And it's going to be precisely those subcultures that have not yet been co-opted by the system yep. or have shown themselves as being in rebellion to the system. That's where you're going to find the best hope for uh, some sort of reclaiming of a genuine consciousness. Right? And, so, and Marcuse... And so we have to celebrate 
no, the drug ahead. addicts. We have yeah, to exactly. celebrate the criminals. Exactly. We have to celebrate right, that anybody who wants to drop out of society right. and stick it to the man in any way form. Because and that's in one dimensional man. Co that's, that's in right. one dimensional man. That's exactly. where you can find another dimension. Is in the He calls them the outsiders, the racial minorities, and they are to form a coalition with the leftist intelligentsia, meaning him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to create a new counterculture movement. That's so, right. so while this is happening, tell me, tell me about then what's happening with the postmoderns. Right. And no, yeah, this is in parallel because, in a way, what Foucault, sorry, what Marcuse is doing, is he's still saying this is the way things really work, right? and uh, this is a kind of social science and a kind of sociology that we're doing and a certain understanding of the way human psychology works as it is manipulated by various kinds of cultural organs. So he's still saying he's operating within a kind of realistic framework yep. and within a quasi-scientific framework as well. So what the postmoderns, though, are going to do is uh, bring in an anti-realist right, and, a, and a more anti-rational epistemology. Right? They're going to say that you know, to someone like Marcuse, to use him as an example, we hear you, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, but uh, you're still making claims about the way things really are, and we are now skeptical about those claims. Right, right. right. Hmm. So things are even more chaotic than than you think. So then, with 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 Foucault and his understanding of power relationships and so forth, where were you you going back to the where we started our conversation quite a while ago, was about power. Mm. and an understanding of power. And so how does Foucault then understand power from that yeah. perspective? Well, uh, the, the postmoderns, there is a political story that, uh, that can be told here. Uh, so they will, uh, you, know, you know, Foucault in the early 50s joined the, the French Communist Party. So he was, was a true believer. Uh, Jean-Francois Lertard was uh, yeah. also a communist. Uh, yeah, true believer. Derrida did not quite join the French Communist Party, but he published in journals published by French communists, right, and so forth. So these guys are all far, far, far left, all right, and so forth. And they do drift away in the 1950s. But at the same time, I think the more important part of the story for them is that they all are philosophy PhDs. And Marcuse is a philosophy PhD in the discipline of philosophy. And so they are getting first-rate philosophical educations, and almost always that includes a rigorous grounding on the best epistemological arguments uh, that can be marshaled in, in that era. And the point uh, that I'm getting to here is that if we then are going back to 15 years or so ago, in the early 1950s, uh, I think Foucault's PhD is 1949, but Derrida and Lyotard are in the 1950s. So they're all politically active in a certain part of the political spectrum, but they also are uh, philosophically reaching the uh, the academic, uh, or at least the, the credential peak of their career, getting their PhDs from top-ranked schools in, uh, in, in France. So it's going to be a marrying of their value orientation and or their political orientation with their epistemological understandings, the best philosophy tools that had been developed. And at that point, philosophy was in an extraordinarily skeptical place. You know, so how human cognition works, you know, if you think of all of the elements that feed into scientific method, how we use our senses, how we observe, how we classify, how we make predictions, how we do develop logical and statistical and mathematical methods to test very sophisticated hypotheses and so on. So all of these things that go into robust scientific method, all of those, uh, those elements of cognition, uh, we have to have a positive understanding of how those work if we're going to defend a pro-reason, pro-scientific epistemology. But all of those had been subject to withering attack in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and philosophy was at a very skeptical place at that point. The dominant model, positive model, and I don't think it's a very good model, but it was the dominant positive model, was kind of logical positivism. And it had collapsed by the time mm. we get to the 1950s. Mm. Uh, so they say, no, we've looked at observation, we've looked at classification, we've looked at concept formation and abstraction and and, and semantics and syntax and grammar and logic and math, and it's all just crap. It's all meaningless. 
And so all the philosophers are just saying, well, I guess nobody really knows anything. And this is the education in very sophisticated philosophical form that these then young men are getting, and they're very smart. So then they are saying, we do have a kind of leftish politics, however you want to do it, and we want to be politically active, and we want to transform society, and we believe in our bones that capitalism, liberal democracy, republicanism, and so forth, all of that is nonsense, all of that is crap, but we need to repackage that with a highly skeptical epistemology uh, and that's what postmodernism is. It's a marriage of a certain philosophical skepticism in very robust form with a value orientation that we would call some sort of leftism. So if you were to say right now, just to kind of sum up a little bit, and I hate to cut this off, we're just running out of light. Mm. What would you say, how are all these things manifest today in what we're having to deal ah, with? Yes. Well, <clears throat> that's another very hard question. <laughs> because that was going from the 50s and 60s to <laughs> yes. 2021. So summarize yeah, the last 60 just, years in uh, you before did the light goes. You, you can handle it, yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, I'll say a few things about the postmodernism. Maybe James can take the, uh, the, the, the critical theory. We will end up doing it at a seafood restaurant over yes, here someplace. Fine. Yes, that's uh, My reading of postmodernism is that it's ultimately a nihilistic movement. Yeah. So it's 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 critical, it's negative, it's in in linguistic form, it's deconstructing, it's re, uh, and that's the Derrida element. It's uh, it, it's reducing everything to power politics in the uh, the Nietzschean slash Foucault direction as well. Uh, so everything can be destruct uh, deconstructed. Uh, everything just is a moral power if you read that strain of Foucault and you take it you take it seriously. So my view is that uh, the end game, it's a game is not quite the right metaphor here, but the end state of postmodernism is a complete hollowing out of all things. Yeah. Everything that philosophy yes. is going to have anything to say on, it's going to reach uh, a, an emptiness. An, uh, now, if you're talking epistemologically, you will call it skepticism. If you're talking metaphysically, you'll call it anti-realism. If you're talking uh, 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 ethics, you'll be talking cynicism. If you're talking politics, it's just going to be animalistic power struggle, but it will reach an endpoint of, of nihilism. So then I think postmodernism stops, and when you get to nothing, right, and a philosophy that supports a nothingism, it's not going to predict anything. Anything can follow from nothing. And I think at a certain point it's going to, to uh, uh, be completely unpredictive of what direction society is going, going to go. Then it becomes a matter of who picks up these tools and what agendas they already happen to have that they put them in the service of. And there's nothing that the philosophy is going to predict at that particular point. But I do think that there is such a thing as human psychology and uh, uh, that's, that's built into our nature, and to some extent it's plastic, but to some extent it is not plastic. And I think one of the things that is true of human nature is that we, uh, we need to believe something. We need to uh, make commitments to action, and because we are a cognitive species, we need to have policies and principles to, to guide our, our actions as well. And so unless you are a, a, a paid philosopher or a paid intellectual, whose job it is to think about skeptical arguments and, and to develop them, it's almost impossible for most people to live in real skepticism for very long. Because that just points to inaction, to nothingness, right. to just a complete defeatism and a giving up. Yeah. So I think the way it operationalizes in human psychology is people will just take the lesson I just say, well, I, I do my postmodern philosophy. I'm smart enough to see where this is going. It's going to nothingism. It's going to nihilism. I guess this just tells me that philosophy is completely pointless in my life. It's not worth trying to think about things too much. I have a value framework. Who knows where it came from? But I happen to believe certain things, and I like certain things, and some things seem to be uh, pointing in the direction of my having a meeting. I'm just going to make a subjective commitment to those things. Don't ask me for a great argument for them. Don't ask me for a foundation. I'm just going to make a subjective commitment and try to impose a, a meaningful life on, on the world. 
And of course, you're going to be doing the same thing for, from different starting points and those people over there. But we're not going to have any rational, principled, philosophical recourse to sorting our differences. So it will just be nasty uh, uh, street fighting, tribal politics uh, in both physical and psychological form. So that's how I would quickly get to where we are today. So you asked a minute ago to kind of to, to flesh out the story briefly, what how Foucault conceived of power. Well, it, it, for, he actually makes the the explicit analogy to power working like an electrical grid. People often draw from the metaphors of their day, but power had been thought of before Foucault doing this as being a top-down process. You know, a weight pressing down from above is one way you could phrase it you know, top down in the authoritarian sense, or, you know, it comes from God, or it comes from the king, or, you know, it comes from the, from the, the, the established government, however that is, democratic or what have you. And so power is top down, and Foucault said, no, it works like an electric grid. It works through everybody by the discourses that they engage in, and the beliefs that they hold, and the cultural values that define the culture that they're in. And it turns out that this particular belief grafts on to what was going on with Marcuse and the, the, the neo-Marxists very, very eff effectively, because they're over here talking about systems of power. They're over here talking about that there's a system of, uh, whether it's capitalism, that it creates a system in which people operate, very systemic type thinking, whether it's as we start moving into the post one-dimensional man era, post-civil rights era, whether it's a system of white supremacy, whether it's a system of, we look at the gay rights movements of heteronormativity, whether it's a system of patriarchy borrowing from the feminists, and so on. You have these systems that are very determinant of how people live. And we can go back to the resentment, that curdled envy. Is I like the way you described it as like, mm, yes, curdled, like cur business. curdled yes. envy. Mm. It's envy or resentment that you feel that's gone bad. Mm. Right. And uh, that all, you know, can be outsourced into these systemic explanations. Oh, the system is screwed. The capitalist system is screwing my life. The the patriarchal system, the white supremacy system, this is what's screwing me up. It's not me. It's not individual responsibility. It's not any of this. It's that. So you have this systemic line of thought. And these activists are very much true believers in whether it's some kind of liberation or whatever. Liberationism became very popular uh, in those lines. And especially the, the black feminists who were very much both women's lib and black liberationists really carried the line forward largely because of Angela Davis, but not entirely, partly because of the movement that Marcuse uh, inspired, partly because of just the, the social and political and cultural conditions going out of the 60s through the 70s. This line really became defining of, of, of the kind of activism, the set of, of strong ideological commitments that were eventually going to pick up this, oh, Everything boils down to power. Power works through the, uh, through systems, but the system makes power work through a grid. And now, look, there's this social constructivist thesis that kind of explains how that works. The power works through socialization. Uh, the, the culture that we live in, this, this milieu that we find ourselves in, conditions us to think in certain ways. It's not quite as Marcuse had it, that the heteronymous interests are conditioning us. It's the everything in the whole system, everything around us, the way we speak, the way we talk, the way we're raised, the way we do business, every single thing, the norms of society are now conditioning us, socializing us to be who we think we are. And that becomes the new side of false consciousness. And this is really the birth of something new that we might call today as it's evolved further and matured in some sense. Uh, this is weird to call it maturing philosophically because it's mm. kind of permanently in tantrum, <laughs> but uh, that whatever the you know, diapers phase, but it, as it has, has matured, it will say philosophically, you know, this is the, what has become woke ideology or critical social justice, which to be very technical, just as we've been so philosophical, the correct name under critical social justice for its operating system is critical constructivism. It is the fusion of critical theory onto social constructivism. So it is this blending of the some of the social constructivist and power-based ideas that people like Foucault and even Derrida to some degree had, uh, fusing critical theory into that. So now their, their kind of almost radical egalitarian view that they had somewhat within postmodern due to their left commitments becomes grafted with the critique that had come out of this, this previous school. And this 
you know, was really happening by the 1990s going into the early 2000s to the point where in the early 2000s through 2005 you start reading papers. No, we still need a materialist feminist feminism. No, we still need these other methods of analysis and the the word that had conquered all under the critical constructivist banner was intersectionality. Everything had become intersectional and that is what matured forward going into these kind of very almost mm. faith-like tracts that you see mm. um, with say, you know, white fragility is a very faith-like tract. You have this, this almost spiritual uh, imminent white supremacy system that's everywhere always and you know it's bad and that's the sin you have to repent of and you almost have that kind of a vibe as it's matured because lacking sound principles into something you know almost charismatic and faith-based is the direction it's most likely to evolve so when when Stephen says that it's who picked up these tools that matters it turns out that it wasn't it, it was these these offshoots, the liberta liberationists who shot off of that late 1960s, early 1970s neo-Marxist line, who picked up these tools, and they have, they have been running the football. So now you have this combined social construction critical theory engine called critical constructivism that's been running the show, and that's where we end up today in a quite technical sense. Stephen, could you wrap it up for us? Can I wrap it up before? Yeah. Well, we can come uh, full circle on this question of power. That's very nicely said, what uh, you just went through. Absolutely. James, by the way, is uh, to say that this is, on my reading, the end result of the counter enlightenment, if we just look at it all through the lens of, of power. So the idea of the enlightenment is that we do want to empower people, empower the individual. Actually, power is a good thing, right? Education is a form of power. Wealth is a form of power. Political speech is a form of power. And we want individuals to have a lot more power. Now, partly that's tied to a sense of individual agencies and a more benevolent understanding of human nature that we think human beings will use their power in genuinely progressive directions to solve all of the, the problems of the world and we have a, a sunlight, sunlit, sunlit vision. But what we have there, though, is uh, an underlying metaphysics, that it's individuals who are the units of power. And individuals have agency. Right? They have a power within them that is up to them to control. And what we find in the counter-enlightenment, that it gets Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and all the way down to the heirs that we are talking about now, is a reversal of that. It's a dissolution of the individual. That power is not something that individuals use. It's rather power uses individuals for their ends. So you see this in Hegel, that the individual is just born into a cultural milieu, and providence has a purpose for that individual, and it comes down and it constructs the individual and uses the individual for its end. And in the case of most of the great men, like Julius Caesar, right, and Alexander the Great, once it's used them, it discards them. And then power goes on its, its merry way. And you find the same thing in Marx with a structural analysis of power in economic form. You are born into a power dynamic playing out in economic form, and you are totally constructed by your class membership, but you too have a role to play in the ongoing dynamic. And the same thing is true of Nietzsche, and this is an interesting point for another conversation. Nietzsche has a reputation for being a strong individualist, I get that, but he is very clear that the will to power is not something that you have, that you as an individual can decide what you are going to do, but rather power is something that manifests through you, right? That power is using you, it's trying to create through you and by using you something beyond you, right? So that inversion from individuals having agency and empowering them to go on to put together fruitful lives, the individual is dissolved, power then becomes the agency working through us, but it's conjoined with all of this conflictual and adversarial stuff coming out. And so it is the counter-enlightenment coming to full fruition in our generation uh, and, of course, we still have a significantly large number of people committed to a broadly enlightenment model. That's our philosophical conflict right now. Sort of metaphorical that that hit at sunset, right? <laughs> like the light can go out. 
Ah, okay, that's true. Well, there will be another sunrise tomorrow. Let's end on a positive note. I like that.